there's been multiple major large scale cyber attacks on DOD. The Chairman and Joint Chiefs of Staff tells me over 100,000 times a day the Pentagon is hit. The White House, so many different places now, coming from Russia, China, from all different types of different actors playing bad behavior. What do you think is the future of espionage? And what, what would you recommend how CIA and DOD change in the future to effectively combat this <coughs> challenge? I think you have to divide the, the cyber threat into, into several buckets. The first is the use of cyber for the collection of intelligence. There are probably 75 or 100 countries that do this. And we've been doing it since the 30s and, and even before, in terms of intercepting signals and so on. So things like uh, hacking into OPM and getting my records and everybody else's, that's an act of espionage. And as, as the Director of National Intelligence put it, if we could do it to them, we'd do it in a heartbeat. And maybe we have, who knows. But, so that's the first bucket. And that's traditional, it's been going on forever. The second bucket is the use of cyber to collect economic intelligence or technology that is commercially and economically advantageous to the state doing it. Now, frankly, until the Chinese got so good at it, the best country in the world, the most efficient and sophisticated country in the world doing this was the French. Uh, and I would often ask businessmen visiting France, well, do you take your laptop? Yeah, well, do you take it to dinner with you? Well, no. I say, well, what do you think about the French intelligence services breaking into your hotel room and surreptitiously downloading your laptop if they think you've got technological or competitive financial information? The Chinese have surpassed that, but there are probably several dozen countries that do that kind of collection. Interestingly enough, the United States, the UK, and Australia, New Zealand are the only countries that do not, and Canada, are the only countries that do not do that, that have the capability, but don't do it. The third bucket is just ordinary crime. Hacking into somebody's bank account to steal money, or into a bank to steal money, or credit cards, things like that. It's just ordinary crime. And then the fourth bucket is the one that worries people the most, and that is the use of cyber for the destruction of infrastructure uh, or uh, some capabilities within the country. This is the one that worries most people. And there are probably 10 or a dozen countries in the world that have this capability. My view is that most of those countries, and I would say especially Russia and China, do not you would not use those capabilities against the United States except in wartime. I think they see them more like nuclear weapons. Because first of all, ultimately the attack is attributable. It's hard sometimes, but it can be done over time. And they know the retaliation would be severe. And it could be conventional military, it could be cyber. So I think like nuclear weapons, states like <coughs> Russia and China in terms of the United States, we'll put those capabilities on the shelf and keep them there in the event there's ever a big war. That is not to say they will not use them against smaller countries, as the Russians have used them against Estonia, Georgia, Ukraine, and so on. The biggest worry and the one that keeps, I think, U.S. security officials awake at night is the possibility of a non-governmental entity, a terrorist group, acquiring this capability because there is no doubt in anybody's mind that they would use it in a heartbeat if they got it. And because there's no home address in terms of retaliation. And so that's, that's the biggest worry that I think people have. We have, I'm sorry to report to you, we actually have very good capabilities to defend ourselves uh, and our networks. And DOD does a good job of protecting our classified networks. 
when I was secretary, we, in, we started a, 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 an effort to extend our protective umbrella over uh, key defense industries on a voluntary basis. So they would give us enough information that we could basically put this umbrella over them and protect them. It was obviously in our interest, but it was in their interest as well. The problem is that while we have these capabilities and apply them in the dot mill world, we have not reached a degree of political consensus that allows us to apply those defenses to dot gov or dot com. Now, Janet Napolitano and I, in, in July of 2010, reached a deal. We basically decided to just cut through all the bureaucratic BS. And, and I said, look, Janet, we have to, the purists are waiting for there to be a domestic NSA that can protect our domestic networks and so on and so forth. There will never be such an institution. There isn't enough time, there isn't enough money, and there isn't enough human capital. So NSA is our only defense, and we've got to use it for both domestic and foreign purposes. So my statutory responsibilities are against foreign threats. Yours are against threats to the homeland. What if I agreed for you to appoint the deputy director of NSA who would, have, who would work for the Secretary of Homeland Security and have the authority to task NSA on a real-time basis to extend networks over the domestic infrastructure. She thought that was a great idea. We went to the president with it. He agreed. And we signed the memorandum of understanding. And we had actually kind of parted the bureaucratic Red Sea. Unfortunately, the Red Sea came back together and because of the lack of, of consensus in the executive branch, in the Congress, and between the government and business, those defenses are not now usable, uh, and we don't have the policies in place to allow us to use those defenses domestically. And it's not a partisan issue. You've got Republicans that are divided, Democrats are divided, the Obama administration is divided, there are a lot of people in the business community that don't want to give the government the kind of information the defense industry shared with us to allow uh, the extension of those defenses. So, so we have, the sad thing is we have the capability, but we have not been able to develop the political consensus that would allow us to deploy defenses of our infrastructure.